welcome to Distinguished Diva and welcome to Colorful Conversation again with me and another inspiring woman that I want to introduce to you. So meet Marion. Hello Marion. Hi. Would you like to introduce yourself to us? Well, I'm Marion, <laughs> as we've said, and I am mum, first and foremost, career woman, business owner, um, and a couple of other things in my spare time. <laughs> but yeah. What kind of other things? Known to write a song or two. You write? Oh my god. Okay, I didn't know that. Oh yeah, I don't. I do, but not professionally. That is purely hobby. But that's good hobby to have. It's nice. So it's very cathartic. We can call you an artist and um, a scientist. I try to mix the two. Funnily enough, I work alongside a group of women who are trying to promote the link between science and art. Um, that's just something that started recently. So. We believe. I think that there is always a link between those. Two. Absolutely. So, what do you do as a career woman? You said okay. you're a career woman. So, I am in engineering. Um, I studied, originally I studied materials engineering, but I've never actually been a materials engineer, like most people who study materials engineering. I study anything. Exactly, it's very rare. It, do you know what, my parents have always said a degree is a dis discipline. Mm -hmm. It's really to just show that you've got the discipline to complete something and give you transferable skills. Mm -hmm. But at least I went into engineering, so that's... You know, good. something. But I'm actually in project engineering, more specifically planning engineering. So I've been really blessed in my career. I've been able to work on a number of large projects based in London, mainly around um, the rail and more specifically the tubes. Oh wow, so when we get into the two, we should always remember there might be a project you are in? I've been lucky, I've touched a lot of the projects to do with the tubes, so yeah, probably, but it's always a massive team effort, and by massive I do mean 400, 500 people strong teams. Yeah, but so. still, I feel a bit safer in the tube now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, we will always try to get you there on time. <laughs> that is true, that is true. So you're also a mum. I am. With a beautiful, beautiful son. He is. Who is, is somewhere right here. Yes. How <laughs> do you combine motherhood and womanhood? And also because I know you, like you're a woman, you get out there, you do your own thing. I but do you're try. still a mum. So I am. Okay, so the key, I think the key is um, never trying to do things alone. Hmm. Um, because there's a reason why we're all here. I believe in, I believe strongly in that, that we all interconnect and having that help, don't, don't force yourself on other people, but if people offer you help and are able to help you, accept it with the love that it's given and also then pay that forward. So make sure that wherever possible you can help other people, you do. Mm -hmm. And don't expect anything in return, but just understand that the universe will work its way around so that it comes back to you. Wow, I like this. The Like when you say the universe will work its way around, because I know that a lot of young people are always looking into what we can get from a situation. Absolutely, a lot of people do. And I think what you just said is look like what you can give. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Have that always worked though? Like, Okay, let me, I'll be frank, I'm not, um, don't get me wrong, I'm not sort of give, give, give and, and completely selfless mm -hmm. although to me I like to look at trying to see what it is I want out of life understanding how what I want might benefit other people as well mm. and hoping that if I help somebody even if I don't have anything that I'm going to get back directly I've always found that indirectly some way what I need and what I want does come to me mm. so I think putting positivity out there helping people has definitely spoke volumes in my life because I do help a lot of people wherever I can that's my nature mm. I'm just quite helpful if I can give I will give but I've found that I've never been left wanting mm. so if you're giving everything out and you've never been left wanting there has to be balance right and I'm not in control of that balance but then I'm also a very I'm a, I'm a Christian so I mm. believe in God and I believe in doing the right thing and living a, a life that God would want me to live. Mm. I like that represent him in your yeah, life. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. what I believe in. That, that, that's beautiful because a lot of young people, especially in this age, we also have the issue of uh, disappointment in organized religions. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah. Okay, so and it's quite strange that I say I understand that because I am Catholic. Hmm. So I think that's one of the most uh, 
It's one, it's one of the poster childs for disappointment. God mm. forgive me and sorry for any Catholics <laughs> out there. I am still Catholic though, but I've always believed that when you go to a church and when you select a church to go to, it should be something that gives you spiritual food for thought. Mm. It should be something that feeds your spirit. So when I go to church, I don't go to church and say, right, I'm a Roman Catholic and, you know, I believe in everything I'm being told. What it, it means is that my beliefs do align more closely with that doctrine given by Roman Catholicism. However, there may be times where I question it. But mm -hmm. you should always be questioning because your relationship with God should be one that's personal. Mm -hmm. And you can only build on your personal relationships through questioning, through spending time. And you can't expect somebody to give that to you. So I find that people tend to get disappointed in organised religions when they're expecting things to be given to them. And I say that with the greatest respect, but a lot of the time we get busy in our lives. Mm. So you want to kind of pigeonhole things. Okay, Sunday I'll show up to church, I'll get me a dose of God. Mm. <laughs> a dose of God on and Sunday, then, and, and then that's, that's it. it. <laughs> and, it doesn't, and then obviously if the people who are handing out this sort of dosage to you disappoint you <laughs> or, dis or disappoint you yeah you you fight you will fall out of favor with religion mm. but you've got to remember that these are just people mm. with all the same failings that any person has so if you find that they've disappointed you that shouldn't that shouldn't shake your faith mm. it might dis it might make you decide to change where you choose to to worship, worship yeah but it shouldn't shake your faith okay that's very interesting Okay. So organized religion, we discussed that. How? So I know you have you and your sisters and your mom, and you have a very close relationship. Like the mm -hmm. person actually who introduced me to you was like, so they're the classic West African family. <laughs> <laughs> that was what he said. Yeah, that's and I was fair. like, okay, I want to meet this person. And then when I came to your house and I met your mom, is like very close knitted. How mm -hmm. do you achieve that? Like you're all women. We are. It is a struggle. Let me not lie to you. I would love to paint you this wonderful picture of, you know, harmonious family bliss. And actually, for the most part, it actually it is. It, but it is a struggle and it is a jostle to understand everyone's position hmm. within that setup. I, li I always say to people I live in a commune because obviously hmm. all of my family are virtually here. I mean, the only people who aren't are the brothers, but they're here on Thursdays and Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, do you have like days where they always come? Oh, one hundred percent. So Thursdays, Thursday night after work, I always expect to see my brother, his wife, the kids, my other mm. brother, his child, his girlfriend, um, and Sundays as well. We'll have a full day of it, food, talk, and we always make the joke about everything that gets discussed around my kitchen table mm. because we literally sit around the kitchen table and discuss every topic. We go from politics to music to everything. Anything. Are you into politics? Um, I'm into everything. I'm in the world. <laughs> you discuss everything. <laughs> so, and even if, and, and that's another thing, it's even if you're not necessarily so knowledgeable or so up on a particular subject, because we're so different, but we're so close, when we have these discussions, it's a learning opportunity. Mm. And it's almost like everybody brings to the table what it is that they've understood in the world this week. We kind of discuss it, we make fun at it, and it's generally a laugh. And the children, they look after themselves and do crafts. <laughs> <laughs> and we just get a There talk. is a beautiful heart piece in your kitchen. I would like to get a snap of it. Like, how do you make the kids do that? Like, the literally, art? remember I told oh, you like, yeah, to do okay. this? Well, do you know what? When we, would see, when we were designing the house and we wanted a kitchen that was really clinical we wanted it to be completely white but we didn't want it to feel sterile mm. so we thought okay what are we going to do we need some artwork and we were finding it really difficult to engage with artists because again i think that people who are do, uh, partaking in a craft mm -hmm. you should respect that and you should try and you know engage with them wherever possible so if you have money to spend on art you should go out seek the art you really like or you connect with i don't know a great deal about art but you know what you connect with, mm, right? Yeah. So we were finding it really difficult to find an artist that would actually commission, to commission a piece of work. So in the end, we just thought, Do you know what? We're not gonna feel as close to anything that, other than what we've done ourselves anyway. Mm. So we kind of thought, okay, what's not sterile? That was, that was actually the, the, the piece. Okay. What is not sterile? And so we started looking at Jackson Pollock. Yeah. And um, we, I think we went to the tape with the kids and they, they loved it. And, you know, I think one of the kids said, you know, oh, well, we could do that. 
And we thought, <laughs> that's presumptuous, child. <laughs> nice, child. But, okay, actually, you know what? We can't do this, but we can give it a go. Yeah. So we sort of bought some canvases and we laid them out in the garden. And we bought some paint and we gave the kids some paintbrushes and put them into their like bin bag liners. <laughs> and we just told them, right, start flicking. And so they were flicking lots of different colours. And it was amazing because you've got a lot of movement and because you've got a lot of, it's, it's chaos, basically. Mm, yeah. And when you bring something that's a large number of large canvases together and it's chaotic, and then you bring it into a sterile kitchen, all of a sudden it doesn't feel sterile anymore. Hmm. Um, and there's and because we use bright colours, there's a warmth it brings. Um, so yeah, that was why we did that piece there. That is beautiful. Uh, the other question I have for you is like we've had this discussion, but I would like you to share. I remember watching Hidden Figures yes. and was discussing it with you and say like how I felt and like reflecting. And you said as a woman engineer and also a black woman engineer. Most of the experiences were your experiences in uni. Like, how yes. does it feel to be a black woman in engineering, which is predominantly male space? I am so used to it that it almost, it almost is just become the norm for me. So it's only when you watch something like you do figures that you think, oh, actually, it's not the norm. It shouldn't be. <laughs> it, should, it shouldn't be. And that's not yeah. to say that um, you know I'm constantly having to fight big battles. Mm. Funnily enough, it, I, what I liked about Hidden Figures was it isn't the big battle that I noticed. Mm. It was the fact that they captured all of the small, tiny ones. Yeah. So, you know, I always make the joke that if you see the word defensive in the dictionary, right next to it is a black woman, according to most careers. Yeah. So when you go into your appraisals, the higher up you go, you'd always find that they use the terms defensive, aggressive. And it's not because you are necessarily a defensive or an aggressive person. It's just, you know, I find personally, there are certain microaggressions that you deal with every day. Mm. Um, and they're not me, they're not big, but they're just every so often. And I'll give an example. So if I'm in a meeting, mm -hmm. the automatic assumption is that I'm there as admin or yes. Admin. Yeah, because it's a good job. We're not dissing admin, but no, it's absolutely. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. But there's an assumption that there are only certain ro roles a woman will play, or if they assume that you're senior, they assume that you're maybe in HR. Again, nothing wrong with HR. Very good job, extremely, extremely useful, useful job, and it takes time to build yourself up in that career. But they, there's certain roles that people find comfortable to sit your particular face in. Hmm. Um, and that's an assumption and nobody's done it out of malice hmm. but that's what it is and what I find is if I I mean I've worked in my industry for a long time now so what I find is when I walk into a room everybody knows who I am anyway so if they need to address me in a certain way they do and that's fine it's when somebody new comes into the business hmm. and maybe they're sitting at the table and then you know there's this thing around tables with directors or with management and people want to sort of kind of understand a way up where they sit in the pecking order of things mm -hmm. and if someone's new they tend to want to take out the low-hanging fruit or the runt they want to go for somebody who looks easy in the pack and somebody who looks easy in the pack unfortunately is always going to be me because I look young I'm not <laughs> that's all makeup and smoke and mirrors <laughs> but you know they oh, you have to tell us where you get the <laughs> drink of youthfulness um, I don't God has God has been good and blessed us with Mac makeup <laughs> just saying um, so I'm old, old but people assume I'm young and obviously I'm black and I'm a female mm -hmm. and all of those things play a part into how people read a situation and so they always will then think that they can make maybe a certain comment or a snide comment to make themselves to elevate themselves within that room so do you think people need to like uh, of course people do this constantly, but as a black woman, do you think it's easier for people or there's a way to avoid people feeling better about themselves when they put you down? No, you can't control other people. Exactly. What you need to do is know who you are, huh. be confident in what you're doing. And, and here's the key, there's a lot of times where I've noticed that people, some people are, fee you know, are blessed with the ability to come into a room, they don't necessarily know the job, but they're able to blag it. Mm. 
I've never been that person. Mm. I need to know my job inside out. I need to probably know the job of the people below me. I need to know the job of the people above me. And then I feel comfortable. If It would be better if I could black it. <laughs> but I'm not that person. I need to know. Mm. So once I know, I have that confidence and I'm able to not really take it on the chin. I just take it on the chin rather. I don't let it, I don't take it to heart. Mm. Um, I always say to people, I give people the opportunity to misjudge me because everybody makes judgments. Mm. Um, and we do that out of just a natural self-defense. It's, it's important, you have to make an instant judgment. But what I don't appreciate is when people now come to know more and still fall back to a default position. Mm. So I always give people the opportunity to misjudge me once. Yeah, the second time what do you do? The second time they, they are told. Because to me, I now need to check and address your position towards mm. me. So, you know, I've had an example where, uh, you know, a gentleman at work was particularly aggressive. And he came to my desk and he had a belief of about a way of doing something, which actually, funnily enough, I shared. But he still felt the need to sort of impress upon it me, he, you know, that he wanted to be the one to say it. And he did it in an aggressive tone in front of my team. Hmm. And it was the second time he'd spoken to me in a fashion that I believe to be unprofessional. Hmm. So I simply allowed him to finish and said to him, I'm, and I then put across my point, and then in closing, I then said, I'm not sure if you're aware, but the way in which you're speaking to me is unnecessarily confrontational mm. and you're just being aggressive. Please don't speak to me in that manner again. Was that resolved? It's, it was soon resolved because not only did I say that, I'm also a stickler for dotting I's and crossing T's. Mm. So I simply then went to my email. I actually wrote out exactly what had happened blow by blow I forwarded it to my manager I forwarded it to his manager and ended it with a simple note that said I do not feel the need to take this further formally hmm. however if this continues and people within the team at large not just this gentleman but if the team at large do not find a way to discuss things in a professional manner then I will feel the need to take hmm. it forward and to me I'm not one for making a big deal out of it um, and you know I was asked if I felt I needed an apology because mm. um, to be fair they took they took it very seriously and they handled it as they should and I said no there's no need for an apology but going forward I just expect a respectful tone and I will always accord him a respectful tone going forward that's what's happened and we've never needed to discuss it again mm. I think just meet things head on don't and, and that comes with time in your career I think as well just meet things head on, discuss things openly, have no back agenda, and I think mm. you kind of navigate the politics. Mm. That, that is good to know for young professionals or people in the workspace generally, because it is hard for being a woman, and mm. then the intersection of being a woman and a black woman is harder, so you need to find a way to navigate things. And I think there is the assumption that black women are aggressive. There is. We're sassy, we're overconfident, we're too eloquent, and I think the right way is to put it in an email. Like you said, that's Talk a good arms, way to go around teeth. it. And like, yes, I have proof, because an email is actually a formal document. So Absolutely. Yeah. And that's why they have to address it. Mm. So it meant that we could diffuse it without taking it or escalating it through the HR process. Yeah. But it was there as something that backs up a statement, should we need to do that at a later yeah. stage, if it continues. Mm. Yeah. So I've not only spoken to him, I've also let people know wider, and that's that it's dealt with. And again, like I say, I was quite lucky. I worked for a company that takes that sort of thing quite seriously, and they dealt with it as they should. I really hope a lot of companies will do this. Yeah, I think more and more people do. And I'm, again, I've only ever really worked for large corporates within my engineering career anyway. Um, and definitely they do. Um, I think small to medium companies are definitely coming along now mm. and, you know, there's legislation in place. People mm. know that there's a certain responsibility that they have. So. That is beautiful. So now let's get into you as a woman. Yes. Not as a career woman. <laughs> I love Marion as a career woman, but as a woman, <laughs> what is the go-to thing you do to channel your femininity oh. just around you? Because, yeah. Okay. What makes you feel womanly you know there is the saying that i've met god and she's a black woman <laughs> i've not heard that really really never 
got shirts, t-shirts that I'm, say I've met God and she's a black woman and I love those t-shirts. That's, that's actually like, really funny. <laughs> <laughs> if she is, I'm going to have some questions. <laughs> but, um, I don't, you know, I, if anyone knows me, they know that I love music. I love to dance, hmm. which makes me a party girl. So I'm told. Um, but I, I do love to go out and dance and listen to music and socialise. And so, obviously, I'm a mum and I've got a career, which means there's not as much time for that. But you've really got to make the effort to take out, eke out some time for you. It makes you a better person in all the other realms. Um, but definitely, I think getting dressed up and having somewhere to go. I enjoy good food. I'm a little bit of a foodie. Oh, yeah. I so, yeah. <laughs> so I like to try out new restaurants and, and socialise. And I think that those things... And being in that space makes me feel more feminine mm. because that that filters into other aspects. And it take you know if you get dressed up to go out, it means that you know how to take time to get yourself dressed and what you like to look like in terms of how you want to present yourself. And that makes me feel a bit more feminine. Hmm. You you said you like socialising, which I know. Are you the organiser or just the person oh, who shows MG. up? Yeah, I am not a show up. I am the organiser. I am the family PA, traveller, <laughs> travel assistant. I literally plan everything. I love to plan. I take I think that's taken from my career of being a planning engineer and mm. I just literally apply it to my social life as well. So I will arrange different outings and get togethers and all sorts. I'm definitely a planner, but that's not to say I don't like to turn up. <laughs> I like to turn up. Yeah, it's easier, right? You just like shut up. Oh okay. yeah. <laughs> if somebody tells me there's something happening, I'm very happy to go to someone else's event and just wear a good shoe and a dress and <laughs> and show up. But I do tend to organise. Perfect. Them. Also, let's discuss your business with your sister. Yeah. You have this amazing hair business. Thank you, darling. Uh, yes. Okay. I think the first time I met you, you were telling me about your long hair. Oh yeah. I think it was this one. It was, but this is see, this has been cut. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been cut. <laughs> but it did start life significantly longer. It was at least past my butt. <laughs> okay, so why do you... Th wh why? <laughs> why the why? hair? No, <laughs> why this business with your sister? And what okay. is the... I really like to know the why behind it. Like the why of... Yeah, yeah. Okay. We really... Because hair is political for black women. I think it is. I, I think it's over-politicalised. <laughs> or if that's a word. But, um, yeah. but, fair enough. I guess for me, myself, my mum, my sister, we've always... Or for the longest time, we've worn wig. Not always. I did have a short hair thing for a long time. But um, we've worn wig for a long time. Hmm. And there was a lady who we used to buy our hair from. And she was moving country and wanted to sell the business. Hmm. And because we live in a commune and we buy in bulk <laughs> so that we can get the best, we have more buying power. <laughs> we thought, well, you know what? We're better off buying this business so that we have the contacts directly and we can just buy the hair ourselves. Hmm. But then Anita and I, my sister, started looking at the fact that actually, if we're going to have these contacts, people always ask us where we get our hair and what type of hair we use. Um, we could actually sell some hair too. Hmm. And then it, we took it a step further. <laughs> we then thought, actually, not only could we sell hair, because we're not really sellers, but hmm. we could actually give other people the opportunity to sell hair or give themselves the, the jumping point or the platform to sell hair. So we started our company, BH Def, which is Beautiful Hair Defined. And we said we it's basically a platform that on which we sell hair under the name of Annie May, but people can sign up and they can set up their own it gives them their own website it gives them their own URL and if other people want to sell hair they make a they make a percentage of any sales that they mm. make so it was to to us it was an opportunity to um buy into something that we were spending money on okay um and it was an opportunity to share the information that we had about hair. Um, and not just weave on that's sort of European looking. We do Afro kinky, we do textured. So different types of hair. Um, we just thought it was a platform for women to empower themselves. And if they wanted to make sales and make side money. And everyone wants a side hustle, right? Yeah. 
So I think it's a, yeah. it's like a trend now. Everybody's making something on the side. You need to. I mean, as a female, you need extra money for the handbags and shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Financial <laughs> advice. So this is where I'm going. I think this will be the last question. Uh, what financial, because we're both Africans, right, and women of colour, I think we're at the bottom of the financial ladder somehow, yeah. or that's the, I the don't perception. Know, that's the perception, it might not be true actually, I think it's not true, but anyway, uh, what financial advice would you give to women in terms of having the security to be, um, to empower them, like what would you tell them? Okay, now I'm, I've, there's a few gems I think I mm -hmm. could offer, yes. I hope. Personally, number one, it didn't. Um, this gem came from my dad, so a man of colour, and he said, always make sure that you are able to provide in your life what you need. Hmm. Don't look for someone else to to be able to do that. That's not to say that I'm a independent woman who doesn't want that help. I am independent. I'm perfectly capable of being independent. I would like somebody else to take some of the responsibilities up, <laughs> but. What I think was the important message is put yourself in a position where you can work hard and you can provide what you need to for your life mm. if you have children for your children's life. That way anything that anyone else brings to the table is a blessing, it's an abundance. Mm. And vice versa for that person because obviously if you've come to a situation and you are financially strong or you have a skill which is able to bring money to that, situ to that situation or money to the table, you're going to be... A blessing in their life and vice versa hmm. so that was that was that so for us it was always important to work hard to make sure that we were working hard towards a career that would give us enough money to sustain whatever lifestyle we chose now as it stands obviously I'm high maintenance but I maintain myself so I like nice things yeah, and that's what I mean I by think high a lot of people do. yeah but the thing is a lot of people like nice things but not everyone's willing to work for them Good. And for me, I always say work hard, play hard. I like my car, so therefore I have to earn a certain money. I would like my child going to a certain school, I have to earn a certain amount of money. And so I work really hard and I, make, I work hard to maximise my earning potential. Mm. That means that I've gone on and done my Masters, though, despite the fact that having done my Bachelors, I said I'd never study again. But I did. Because I could see that it would add value to to my worth to a mm. company, mm. and actually it was the best thing I did. It was a really it was really good for me to do my masters. I think it solidified a lot of the things I'd learned in my career. So I did it part time oh, while okay. working. Um, I always make sure I stay up on my career development to understand what's going on that's new. Because you can rest on your laurels and say, right, well I'm earning a certain amount of money. Mm. I don't need to learn anymore. There's always new things to learn. So I like to make sure that every year I do a certain amount of um, professional development, Do even that, if that's a short course or going to put, um, master classes or seminars, just understanding what's going on out there in the world. Because mm -hmm. when you're trapped in a company, you can get trapped in that bubble of thinking you know everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. And you won't. You need to you need so interact. Good. So I think making sure that you have a skill that is saleable, is always going to be useful. If you're going to be a business owner, which I know a lot of people want to do more and more, they want to be their own boss, understand that you are going to work so hard. I think a lot of people go into wanting to own their own business thinking that it, they will have more free time. Yeah, entrepreneurship become a trendy thing. It is trendy and it's absolutely fantastic. It is really fantastic. My brother, for instance, my youngest brother is very entrepreneurial, but he works doggedly. I would say he's probably working harder than the other siblings and you know and we've all worked for other companies mm. although my other brother now who's gone into business ownership and he too understands that intrinsically if you're an entrepreneur it doesn't mean that you've got more time in the day you will have less because you are working doggedly because it's now something that you're putting your name behind and your stamp on so I think there's a misconception about that mm. um it's actually easier to work for somebody else. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you're going home. Exactly. And there is an element of, do you know what, actually, I can put that aside. When it's your own business, it's really difficult to do that and establish boundaries. But if you are going to own your own business, work doggedly to start with, get into a drumbeat, but then do, do establish boundaries so that you can live as well. Mm. But wait until you've got there first. <laughs> True. 
uh, a last question. Sorry, I said last question before, but I just feel like I should. Uh, what has changed in your life after Joe? Yes, sir. Oh, wow. Um, everything. He changed everything. He's like mommy's boyfriend. Mommy's He's son. mommy's everything. <laughs> He's very protective. He's a complete rascal. I wouldn't have him any other way. Um, he changed everything. How you? I've always been a considerate person of other people, mm. but he's my first consideration mm. with everything. If I'm working super hard, yes, I like nice things, but it's mainly because I want to give him a particular lifestyle. I want to have the choice as a parent to give him what I feel he needs. That doesn't mean give him everything, people, <laughs> but give him what I think he needs. So if I feel like he needs certain exposure, certain classes, certain... Um, experiences I want to be able to do that so when I work hard it's because of him if you know when I wake up in the morning I need to make sure that he's ready and he's got what he needs in his day before I can even begin to think about putting myself together mm. um, so he changed everything and he and just understanding that even especially when they're a tiny baby and everything is dependent on you when they eat wh whether they've got a comfortable place to sleep you know, if they've got a itch, itchy nose, <laughs> the teething, everything. You know, it's quite funny. I remember, um, I remember the day that he was born, um, and I remember everybody had gone home, and it was just me and him. And I remember saying, "Right, you will not be perfect, and I will not be perfect, but we'll be okay, and we are okay." And mm. it became a, oh my goodness, you know, I was struck with fear at first. Because I thought, oh my goodness, he's going to be dependent on me. Mm. If he needs something, I've got to figure out what he needs. And I've got to deliver it. Yeah, and he can't speak for himself. And he can't speak. <gasps> when they speak, it becomes infinitely easy, but that's another struggle, folks. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, you know, you could become... I, you know, I remember being fearful, but, you know, just saying those words to myself and him, I just thought, you know what? We've got this. And God's got us. So, and it's been fine, but it does change just the way you see things. Yeah, new eyes. New eyes. Are you ready for another one? Oh. <laughs> oh. They're like, oh, oh, why do well, you Well, I would, I've, all, I've never seen myself being a mum of just one. Okay. But circumstances had it such that I've only had one today. And um, I would love to have another child but it, I leave that to God I leave that to God we'll see what God has for us but it would be lovely thank you so much for sharing everything thank you that no was problem. So lovely thank you guys so we what would you like to tell people like is that something you'd like to share finally that I haven't asked um, no if anything I'll probably just go back to the point that I made in the beginning which is you know we all live on this earth mm. and you should try wherever possible if you can to help people and hopefully in some ways it will come back to you pay it forward pay it forward thank you so much marion and thank you for you guys watching and yeah it was lovely talking to you, you and too. thank you for inspiring me oh thank you <laughs> <laughs>